microservices are different. They have several really useful advantages, but also several fairly significant costs. Their biggest challenge is that they're meant to be independently deployable. This means that we don't get to test them with other services before we release them. So what are the implications of all of this, and how do we test them? Oh, and what does contract testing mean anyway? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, and Transfic. They've all been supporting our channel for a while now, so please do support them in turn by checking their links in the description below. Microservices are a very good strategy for building big systems with lots of people, but they come at a cost. They aren't a great idea for simpler systems or small teams because, because of these costs. So what are the costs and how do we address them? In particular, how do we design and test microservices if we aren't allowed to test them together before we release them? Let's just recap this constraint and why it's fundamental and matters. Microservices are an approach that is designed to optimize for team scalability. They are for bigger teams so that these teams can divide work up between smaller, more focused teams and still make useful progress. The problem of dividing teams up like this is the coupling between them and their software. If I write some code in my service that changes how it's used and your service depends on my service, then I may have broken your code. If I want a new feature in your service that allows my service to do something new, I'm tied to your team in some way unless I work to avoid it. I can either guess at how your change will work and code for my guess, or I can wait until you're done and now your team and mine are working in lockstep, unless your API is backward compatible with the previous version. We are coupled together and can't make progress independently. Both of these cases are a problem of coupling and in big organizations are a very big deal because this coupling compounds. My team's blocked on yours, your team's blocked on Jane's, Jane's is broken by a change somewhere else and so on and so on. The state of DevOps reports say that one of the main predictors of high performance in teams is their ability to make progress independently of others. Microservices was designed to alleviate that problem. Let's be very clear. There's nothing fundamentally new in the idea of microservices, but this independent deployability is the closest to a new idea in practical terms. Let's get back to our two services, yours and mine, and the two ways that they can be coupled. I can break your code changing my service and you can store my development while I wait for a change. There are two ways that we can tackle these problems. We either accept that we must test everything together before release. This checks that I haven't broken your service and that our services are in step and can do useful work together. And for this, to work at any sensible scale at all, what we need is fast, efficient, high quality feedback. So that for this scenario, microservices are a fairly dumb idea. We don't want barriers between our services that slow us down. The easiest way for me to see that I've caused a problem with your service when I change my service is in a continuous integration and a shared repo. We put both of our services together in a single repository, practice continuous integration, and get near instant feedback on whether our changes work together. Similarly, if I need a change in your code to help my service do something new, the easiest, most scalable way to do that is allow me to make the change for myself when I need it, rather than wait for you to schedule it. So again, shared code ownership, single repo, not really microservices. But there's another approach, and that is the microservices approach. For this, we're going to accept the challenge that independence of deployment presents and be willing to pay the costs in terms of a bit of extra work and a bit more sophistication in the design needed to achieve it. 
What this demands of us is really two things. We need to design APIs that are loosely coupled and APIs that we can defend. This is where the ideas of microservices being aligned with a bounded context and being independently deployable really come from. Interfaces between services should be abstract. It's important that they hide implementation detail so that implementation can change. Another benefit of microservices is that they should be easy to replace with better versions. So we don't want the detail of how they work inside leaking out. Aligning them with a bounded context helps with all of this. But the other part of the technicalities of dealing with the boundaries between bounded contexts is that you should always translate at these points in communications. Ports and adapters is a really good design idea at these points to provide a bit of helpful insulation between our services and a place in your design to cope with changes more easily. We'll come to that later. So now we have a service. It has a well-defined API of some kind and it only interacts with other services via their well-defined APIs. These APIs could be anything. No reason at all why they should only be HTTP. That's not in the definition of a microservice. Perfectly valid to have a microservice that consumes or publishes binary data or anything else. But tagged data formatted messages can help, but we'll get to that. My preference is that services are message-based and asynchronous. I think that makes our life easier, but this is still just my preference. Nothing in the definition of microservices said that they must be. Let's imagine I want to create a customer registration service of some kind. It allows me to register new customers. So here's an add customer message. It contains a customer name and an address. And in response, it generates a customer added event that contains a customer name and a unique ID that's been generated by our service. I could have chosen to include the address in the response, but by doing that, I'm coupling the idea of customer to the idea of address. I know from painful experience that addresses can be quite annoying sometimes and that we may want different things from them at different times. So this is something that I expect to change. So I'm gonna separate that out in my design. If someone wants to ask my service for a customer address, that's fine, but we'll deal with that separately. This is a separation of concerns decision. I've decided that services that are interested in new customers probably aren't always interested in their addresses. Not saying that this is always right, merely that by making this choice, my design is a little bit less coupled, or at least the coupling is a little bit more discreet. When I store my new customer, I could just take the incoming message and process and store it as a blob. When somebody asks for a customer, I simply send them the contents of the blob from the store with no translation. That's not a very good design. It may mean that my service was simple to write, but it's now also fragile. If I want my service to evolve, there isn't really very much that I can do here because every consumer of my service is now coupled to how I've decided to store its data. There's no abstraction. There's no information hiding of any kind. This is actually quite a common form of service in teams that are trying to move to expose information from legacy systems, for example. They will often write a service that simply passes on some blob of data. So now consumers are coupled to the service and their implicit understanding of the structure of that data. <clears throat> the service isn't really going to do very much work. It's certainly not reducing coupling. A service, or actually any module or class or function in our code, should keep some secrets, otherwise what's the point? In our example, we have two ideas, customer and address. We've already imagined that addresses may be slightly slippery. What if our business is successful and now, as well as addresses with a UK postcode, we decide we'd like to add support for German or US addresses as well? If a UK postcode is implicit in the data structure that we expose, there's no option but to force on all of our consumers of our service that we want to add US or German addresses. The boundary, the API of our service, is a special place in our design, or it should be. 
It represents an integration point, a designed point at which our aim is to reduce coupling. That's why it's an API in the first place. This is particularly true for microservices because if changes here force changes on others, that's a big deal. If we don't test them together before release, we could break other people's code that way, or maybe even the whole system. So how do we gain the ability to change our microservices safely? The first thing to think about is the information that we expose and how we do it. What does our API look like to a user of our service? What implementation detail secrets do we want to keep within our service and how do we keep them? Our primary goal with the design of our interface is to expose our best guess of the minimum that our users of the service will need to understand to use it. Don't add lots of extraneous detail. Keep it as simple as possible and as focused on the service that you provide as possible. Don't add stuff to the interface just in case or just because we have it so we might as well. Actively design the interface to be simple and minimal. Then present that interface in a way that, as far as we can guess, is likely to continue to make sense in the future. We won't get this right, but recognising that it would be good if we did makes us try just a little bit harder for a decent abstraction now. This is part of how you build a more loosely coupled interface. The other part is how you organise the information and access to it. Let's back, go back to our customer and address. We could decide to adopt a fixed binary format for our messages. The first two bytes are customer ID, the next 100 bytes are the customer name, and the next 200 after that are the customer's address. Everyone that uses addresses now needs to understand the, this fixed structure. Clearly, this is far from loosely coupled. Later, we realise that if we end up with more than 1,024 customers, this design breaks. So we decide to increase the customer order ID to 16 bytes instead of 2. This change breaks our user interface with every user of our service. We could improve things by making a class and hiding the detail of the structure of the data inside it. This is a small step, but it's a step toward looser coupling. Our service users still need the correct version of the class to send or consume the data correctly, but at least they aren't worrying about byte count anymore. So we could abstract this a little bit further. We could add an interface instead of a class. So now we could plug in different implementations beneath the interface. This represents a contract that we are using to manage the conversations between us. We could imagine adding some kind of version number to different implementations of our contract. And then our service, if it was sent in an old version, say one that stored IDs in two bytes, could upgrade the incoming information into a usable form that the latest version of our service needs. We still have some problems though. Things are getting more complicated for our service now. We've now got two classes of users, early users who have ideas that can be stored in two bytes and later users who IDs can't. So we either need to keep supporting both groups or we need to migrate everyone to the new version. In a real microservices world, you don't get to force changes, at least not in lockstep, on other people. So we must keep the old version and the new version of the APIs working alongside one another, at least for a while. So now we have extra complexity added to the design of our service to keep our system stable overall. OK, so most of you probably aren't worrying about bytes and byte order. But you, do you expose a file format or a data stream from, I don't know, a hardware device or a legacy system direct through your API anywhere? Does your service or the code of your consumers need to understand the data structure or file format? Because if they do, you may well be concerned about bytes and byte order after all. The reason that most teams don't need to care is because they've taken another step up the ladder of abstraction. They use more dynamic data structures like XML, HTML, JSON, YAML and so on. These are often tag delimited forms, they're horribly inefficient for ways of sending data, but having the tags means that now we know what each piece of the data means. 
now we can depend on the tags rather than just the position of the bytes. This allows us the freedom to shift things around. If I have a tagged form of my customer and address like this, I can easily add a telephone number. And as long as you don't care what order my tags are presented in, when you consume them, you don't have to assume that you must consume every tag. Then your old code that knew the previous message structure will continue to work with my latest changes. This is another form of loose coupling. So what is the contract, the interface, the API to our system? It's clearly more than only the functions that we invoke to initiate the behavior that we want. It's more than add customer because we publish information too. So it certainly includes customer added and maybe get customer address. Our contract is also the data that our service publishes that represents a customer, their address, their ID, their telephone number, and so on. All this stuff is externally visible and so represents the contract to your service. Changes anywhere here can break communications with other parts of the system. If our service is a genuine microservice, then these are the only places that can break interactions. Because all interactions happen through these interfaces. So this is the goal, the scope of contract testing. Our aim is to confirm that we haven't broken our contract with our external users. We would probably want to evaluate adding a customer and validating the response. To start with, that's probably all we'd need. Later, we'd want to find a customer with an old ID and one with a new one. Later still, we'd add a German customer and a US customer, perhaps, and confirm that their addresses are supported correctly when we ask for them. And later still, maybe that we still get a response when our system was down and later came back up. When we run our contract tests, if nothing changes, then great our changes can't break anyone else, unless our abstraction leaks in some other way. If one of our contract tests fails though, we may have a real problem. So the aim of contract tests is to exercise the surface area of your interfaces with the outside world to spot any changes. This surface area includes the data that you expose um, that consumers need to understand. If a test fails, stop and think, is this an innocent change like adding the telephone number? In which case, as long as communication protocol that we are using between services isn't positional, then it's probably safe to change. Is it a breaking change for some people? Users who used to have two byte IDs can't see IDs with more than two bytes. In which case, we'll have to do more work to insulate these users from change. We could keep supporting the old two byte API, but encourage them to update. Then, when they finally do, we could retire the old API, perhaps. Maybe we keep an old and new version of the service running in parallel. Or maybe we implement support for different versions of the API in our new version of our service. Finally, there may be changes that, for one reason or another, are going to force change on users of the service, whether we like it or not. Now we'll need to go cautiously. Remember, we can't force change in lockstep on our users. We may not even know who our users are. So now we will have to support old versions of the API and communicate with users or people who may be users to let them know of the upcoming changes. We may need to do old school stuff like run a beta programming and support external testing some way. One more thing before I wrap up. I think that recognizing that the interface to your service or system is everything that is visible to the outside world is an important idea. It's not even just all the externally visible data as well as all of the externally visible functions. The operational characteristics of your system or service matter too. This starts to move in the direction of reactive systems, which I cover in more detail in this video. But the idea of the contract of our service or system is not as simple as the functions in an interface or the collection of messages that it responds to. It goes a bit deeper than that. These are the problems of supporting external APIs. And the value of microservices is built on that idea of supporting external APIs. Thank you for watching.